Avalon. Apart from the occasional clicking of keys, Captain Brand's office was drowned in complete silence. While that wasn't strange by itself, what was strange was that this had been a growing trend for the past couple of days now. Ever since we switched to a defensive stance towards the Gratonians, Brand's workload became a mere fraction of what it used to be, and he progressively became more detached as time went on. Our usual small talks throughout the days had dwindled in frequency, and now even single-line exchanges were a rare occurrence. It was part of his routine to start the day with a coffee, but today, the coffee I'd brewed for him sat cold on the table, with barely a sip taken. I recalled the day we received the news regarding the loss of Dominique. Brand had almost immediately set out to create a rescue team for him, unaware of the documents I'd scanned from the stolen caches. When I told him that the enemy had a sentient under control, that Dominique could very well already be dead if they had used it on him, Brand's conviction melted away on the spot. Ever since then, he's been in this downward spiral of detachment. While it gave me much discomfort to see him in this state, the truth was that we didn't have many options available. If Dominique was somehow still alive, he either would have sailed back here on a hijacked warship by now, or taken the dismantling of the Gratonian Federation into his own hands. Considering neither had happened yet, my guess on his fate seemed to be the next most likely possibility. Even now, with our hands-off approach, our safety was still not guaranteed. While I was presiding over the Meldrin system as its sentient guardian, there was no metric for me to gauge my effectiveness as a combatant. My only triumph had been when I was forced against the Meldrin sentient, but that one had been weak and lame, a lab rat born purely for the purpose of cruel testing. If the Gretonians made the decision to send their sentient after me, there was no way for us to know what the outcome would be. And while leaving such a thing to chance was effectively a forfeiture of our lives, once again, we did not have many options available. The only solace to this dreary situation was that their sentient was likely the glue holding their front lines together, and that their method of controlling it was through a limited resource. Until recently, I had always found trouble in trying to figure out how they managed to wage so many wars at once, let alone score victories. I doubted that they would be so inclined as to gamble their entire military integrity away just to wipe us out. So while our best option was to remain at a standstill, that was also the culmination of all that we could manage. A disappointing result, to be sure. I was glad to have this directionless train of thought interrupted by sudden action from Captain Brand. Seemingly on a whim, he shifted from inactivity to purposed movement. I, having been devoid of any social interaction for quite the period now, intently watched as he navigated through the interface before him to the military communications tab. My figurative heart sank once more as he started typing out his intended message. I could predict where it was going after just the first few words. It was an order to assemble a special operations team for a stealthy incursion into Gritonian territory. He fully typed out what would have normally been an oral command for me to relay without falter, and promptly went to click send upon completion. I, of course, intercepted the outgoing of this message. While I wasn't an advocate for insubordination, I couldn't let what was clearly an emotional spur risk even more lives in an exercise of futility. Brand, upon noticing that the message remained unsent, grew a sour look on his face. He impatiently clicked the send button a few more times before glancing up at one of the cameras in his office, effectively making eye contact with me. Avalon, I seem to be encountering a strange bug here. We both knew that this wasn't a bug, and I doubted that Brand's intention was for me to keep up his game of charades. Sir, I couldn't help but notice that this order goes against our stance towards the... Explain it to me, Avalon. How is it that we are suddenly utterly powerless against an enemy that is either lesser than or equal to us by every metric except depravity, where I'm glad to let them take the cake? Up until just recently, they couldn't even manage to lay a hand on us. They tried, and you were the one targeting the cannons that turned their attack into space dust. Sir, in the grand scheme of things, we've just been an annoying thorn in their side. Up until just recently, we would have never been considered enough of a threat to warrant them sending their secret weapon after us. If we bring any more attention to ourselves than we already have, that could change very quickly. See, there's a detail in there that I just can't quite grasp. If they send their sentient after us, wouldn't you be here to stop it? Or are you saying that you wouldn't win? I expected that this question would be coming up. 
I already knew the answer, but admitting out loud that I might be inadequate was like sticking a knife in the ego I wasn't aware I had. If I had a human body, it would be squirming in discontent right about now. The chance that I lose is high enough to justify avoiding that risk. Brand sank back into his seat at that, looking wistfully at nothing in particular. So, that's it then? I'll just sit here until the Grats finally manage to wipe the cluster. Then they can finally turn their eyes towards us without bother and we can find out who wins. If only there was a way to decrease the margin of failure, to have some sort of backup in case things went wrong. If only we had sentient allies, either to take my place should I fail, or to send off as guinea pigs and watch what happens. Sentient allies. I have a proposition, sir. Gratonian civilian Nefod Araxor. And while many communication centers have been hit, casualties were fortunately relatively low. Since then, the human attack has been dealt with, thanks to the quick response of Admiral Indrix Jane's fleet. I decided that it was probably best to mute the news at that point. Arlana was already beginning to pace around the living room, and I'd barely just started my morning. So, does this mean you finally get a day off? My attempt at being lighthearted instead caused her to stop in place and bury her face in her hands before letting out a muffled groan. The last thing I wanted was for her to be in a bad mood, but I was finding it a bit difficult to approach her in this scenario. Even if the sky starts falling, they'll still want me in the office. Oh, I need to get going soon. So she said. But she continued to stand in place with abated breath, watching the muted television. I couldn't see her expression from the couch, but if I knew anything about her, it'd be that she was quick to worry about things that she couldn't control. Not that I could blame her. When she was young, she lived on one of the frontline planets because her family didn't have the money to move anywhere else. She grew up in constant fear of hearing that somebody she had just been talking to yesterday was no longer alive, and it had left a lasting trauma on her. With her family's full support, she was eventually able to scrounge up enough to move here alone, to this frontier planet bordering a peaceful species. Ever since these humans had arrived with their psycho mascot Dominique making a mess everywhere he went, that trauma of hers started resurfacing. Now that we'd actually been attacked, I couldn't imagine what was going through her mind. If I could have done something to magically alleviate her worries, I'd do so in a heartbeat. Instead, all I could do was be there for her. I quietly got up from the couch and walked up behind her, before surrounding her with a hug. That was at least a step in the right direction, as her shoulders became a bit less tense. You know we're going to be okay, right? It didn't matter if it was true or not. What mattered was making her feel better. The humans are new to the cluster, and they barely had enough power to pull off this hit and run. Stuff like this won't be common. I held her there until her heart rate came down to calm levels. I took in a deep breath of air through my nose and held it in until she followed suit before exhaling slowly. At that point, she was no longer tense in the shoulders. You gonna be okay? Yeah. Okay. I let go of her, and she started making her way to the front door. Her job began pretty early in the day, while mine started later on, so we usually didn't have much time together in the mornings. I walked after her to watch her get in her car and leave, and decided to take in the sunny morning for a moment before heading back inside. It was nearing the time that our son, Arlod, would be getting up and preparing for school. The school districts around here were just as strict about attendance as Arlana's workplace, so he probably wouldn't be getting a freebie either. I made my way to the kitchen to start preparing breakfast for the both of us. While I was busy, I spotted him walking down the hall and into the living room from the corner of my eye. He went to his usual morning place, sitting on the bench in front of the windows and watching cars go by. He was already turning six years old in a couple months, and it felt like it had all gone by in the blink of an eye. Every day, he seemed to grow just a little bit taller. They really weren't kidding when they said that kids grow up too fast. I finished making breakfast and quickly set the table before going over to him. A smile involuntarily crept onto my face as I started talking to him. Morning, Arlod. What you looking at? I expected the usual, just the cars from him, but today it was actually something different. He pointed up at the sky before looking at me with confusion. Dad, what's that up there? Since I couldn't see where he was pointing, 
I had to kneel down to match his point of view. As I did, the beautiful morning sun was suddenly blocked out, painting the whole street in a gloomy gray. I glanced up, expecting to see a cloud blotting out the sun, but instead saw part of a massive metal object seemingly suspended in the air. I got up and rushed outside to get a better look. It took a moment before recognition hit me. I had just seen this thing on the news when they mentioned the military fleet that batted away the human attack. I was staring at the underside of a full-on warship, hurtling down to the surface. It rode down on a halo of fire with its center growing orange from the heat. I felt my feet leave the ground. I felt my lungs fill with needles and the world started to tip on its side. I felt this sense of falling with no ground to land on in sight. Despa, despair left no room for panic. Then I felt a tug on my hand. Arlod had come outside and was asking me what was going on. I realized that I was still standing upright and that even though the ship above was very real, it didn't matter at the moment. It was something that I couldn't control. Head inside, quick. The pancakes are going to get cold. Any worries that Arlod might have held were washed away by the mention of his favorite food. Pancakes! I followed him back inside, closing the door behind me. He sat at the table, facing away from the windows, and started scarfing down the food. I walked past him and sat on the other side, facing him and the windows behind him. Normally, I'd scold him for eating too fast, warning him that he might choke. I chose to instead let him enjoy himself this time, as it didn't matter anymore. What mattered was that he was happy.